So good to be with you guys. Um, baby dedications and pleading the blood and all of that. We, it's just amazing. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. I also want to say aloha to uh, Josh, Hannah, and his family in the front row. They're from the mainland. It's good to have them. And one, two, three, four, five beautiful girls and brought them to church today. Praise the Lord. We're so glad that you guys are here. And uh, also my good friend, Tisha Leifelt, in the second row right over here with her husband, Jason. Right there. So good to be in the house of God with you guys. Hey, Lisa and I just came back from Europe for two weeks, and that's why I did the At The Movie series. I missed three weekends because I took last weekend off. But it's so good to be back. We went to different places where the Reformation took place. We went into beautiful cathedrals, sang the doxology in English, the Hawaiian doxology in Hawaiian. And it was incredible just to be there and to see where places where Christianity once thrived, once thrived, it's not thriving yet. It will again, pockets of it, but not the whole, not the continent of Europe. Um, but we, here's what we, we could see. We, we began to see all of these incredible places and spaces. Uh, bumped into Pastor Jürgen, Matesius. He happened to be in Constance, Germany. What were the chances? Uh, and that's Tony on, uh, hanging out with me over there. And that is the Matterhorn. You see the Matterhorn? That was in Zermatt, Switzerland. We went all the way up to the Matterhorn, and that was incredible. And then do you have another slide or just one? All the pictures on one? Just wondering. One. Okay, awesome. Cool. And, um, but there was more to it than that. We went into cathedrals. We went into Baroque-style cathedrals of the architecture of that day, and it was incredible coming back from Europe. I was excited to find out that on Friday at the Summer Bash for Junior High and High School that we, hey, we had over 260 students. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we had. We had 260 students, 50 dream, de uh, dream teamers, most of them youth, and 35 salvations and decisions for Christ. Come on, give God some glory in this house today. And one more, one more thing. We also had, uh, just this past week, we are preparing for the Kapole build-out. Your picture in the back. And it's about, everybody say about time. Okay, say God's timing. There you go. It was God's timing. And we are going to break ground soon, and we'll have an official ceremony. Invite the mayor, dignitaries, bank presidents, uh, all of those people. And we're going to put a shovel in the dirt. Although we don't put shovels in Hawaii, put an o'o in the ground. And when we put the o'o in the ground, the devil's going to say, o'o, we in trouble. It's going to go. That's what we're going to do. Come on. Are you ready for the word today? All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, for your presence that is in this place today. We thank you for people who are finding us and coming to church today. May they feel welcomed by the presence of God. Lord, I pray that you help me to preach. I pray that you help us to lean in and to listen. And Lord, we plead the blood over our lives, over our bodies, over our buildings, Father, over our businesses, over our marriages, over our relationships. Help me to preach. Help us to lean in, to listen. May the words of my heart and the meditation, words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And Lord, I pray that you would tailor make this message, Lord God, for every individual in this room here today, as if only one person is speaking to them, and that's you. Father, I pray these things by the power of God in the name of Jesus, online and in person. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Come on, praise him one more time. He is worthy. So worthy to be praised. I want you to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Also, we have the son of Pastor Evan and Shinobu Carmichael here today. I don't want to point him out because I don't want it to go to his head, but he knows I love him. <laughs> Jaron Carmichael in the second row. Good to have him. Exodus chapter 3. Can we thank the worship team, everybody? Um, we're starting a new series called Defining Moments. How many of you enjoyed At The Movies? You enjoyed At The Movies. You got to see At The Movies. I heard it was good. I heard people like, oh, one more week, please. No, it takes a lot of work for that. Um, next time. Next time we'll go four weeks instead of three weeks. Uh, I heard it was amazing. I wasn't here for it, um, but I heard that it was great. We're starting a new series called Defining Moments. And defining moments. Very, very important. There are going to be times in your moments or you, that are going to define you. There are going to be decisions that you are going to make that are going to define your destiny. Of course, things can change and of course, they can be corrected. 
but we are the sum total, right, of the decisions that you and I make. We are the sum total of our decisions. We are sitting here because of decisions that we have made. Decisions to come to church, decisions to follow Christ, uh, decisions to come back to church and come back and be a part of the body of Christ or follow Jesus all over again. We are the sum total of our decisions. How many of you are going to high school this year? I mean, you, you, you start school this year. Junior high, high school, college, you start school this week, next week. Raise your hand. Homeschool, doesn't matter. You're going to school. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Come on, don't be shy. It's not a tough question. Come on. Not a tough question. Okay, awesome. I'm going to pray for you guys at the end of the service because decisions are going to be huge on the, decision, uh, the choices that you make. See, there, um, Crawford Lawrence, Dr. Crawford Lawrence says that we are, when we are born, we look like our parents, but when we die, we look like our decisions. Think about that for a moment. Think about that for a moment. When we're born, we look like our parents. When we die, we look like our decisions. See, the sum total of our decisions are basically made up on two things. They are proactive. Everybody say proactive. proactive. Write this down if you're taking notes. Proactive. Proactive decisions. I'm going to make a proactive decision that no matter what happens, I am not giving in to that. Proactive. You've already predetermined in your mind and being proactive that you are know when to say no, that I'm going to say no, that I'm going to say yes to this and no to that. Proactively. Proactively, you're going to go to high school, and when you go to junior high or high school this week or next week, you're already settled in your mind that you're not going to start to vape. Because that's the worst thing you could start doing is vaping. Okay? Ask the guys who are vaping how to quit. They're having a hard time right now. And it's anyway, moving right along proactive. If you're going to buy a house, you got to be proactive. If you're going to buy an apartment, you have to be proactive. You have to start getting a better credit score today by paying off your bills in a timely manner and start saving up money in the bank or in your 401k and borrowing off of it. Whatever, whatever strategy you use, you're proactive. So when the interest rates drop from 8% to maybe 5% or 4% or 3%, when it drops, you are ready because you were proactive. Proactive. We also are reactive people. And when we are reactive, we're going to have to make a decision. And praise God, and hopefully we're making the right decisions because we have decided that we are going to follow God with obedience and we're going to make a reactive decision. So a reactive decision can happen when a boss tells you that they're downsizing and they have to let you go. At that point, you have a decision to make. Those are reactive decisions. Hello, are you there? Right? So now, proactive and reactive. Now, there are moves that, that are providential, and then there are things that are defining moments. A defining moment is based upon a decision. Right. I'm going to decide to do this when this happens. I'm deciding. Providential mo moments or providential moves are when something happened and now God comes into play and he's going to have to turn it out for his good and your, for your good and his glory. That's a Romans chapter 8 verse 28 situation. Are you following me? For example, a defining moment for me was when Pastor Ralph, in the day that Lisa and I got married, and we were going to be married for 30 years this September, everybody. Next month, 30 years. The best, best 30 years of my life, I'm telling you right now. Best 30 years of my life. And I'm telling you right now, defining moment is who you pick to marry. Okay? And if you're already married, make it the best that you can. You stuck because you're already stuck. So make, it the, make the most of it. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you, right, you stuck, you married, now make the most of it. Now moving right along, for those of you who are yet to be married, you better marry the right person. That's a defining moment. And so when I look at this, I go, okay, so defining moment was when, Tisha, you were at the wedding, when Lisa and I got married, and we had waited for each other, saved us ourselves for each other, and then all of a sudden, everybody leaves, they're leaving the reception, and Pastor Ralph comes up, to, waits till everybody leaves. And comes up to me and Lisa, puts his finger in my chest, physically puts it in my chest, Elijah, and says, you ought to be a pastor. What? Drop the mic, leave, boom. <laughs> Stare me down while you're walking away. Ruin my honeymoon. Just want to say, ruin my honeymoon. <laughs> Brad, I've been spending the last 30 years trying to make up for that. Anyway, moving right along. Some of you will get that later on. Um, <clears throat> ruin my honeymoon, defining moment. Another defining moment was when I left my job at American Airlines. I loved my job at American Airlines. I had a lot of friends at American Airlines. I was making 20 something dollars an hour, full medical, full dental, $2 copay. Back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, $2 copay. <laughs> and flight benefits, fly anywhere, American or Air New Zealand flew. And you know what? The problem was I didn't have enough money to fly anywhere. 
Uh, so you can't eat flight benefits, right? You, you can't eat them. And so all of a sudden, my mom and dad moved to Portland, Oregon, and now I'm on staff part-time at Hope Chapel, and then Pastor Ralph needs more of my time, says, I need you to be here full-time. I said, Pastor, I still got my other job at American. He's like, I want you to, oh. He didn't ask me to leave. He just said, I, in his heart, he just prayed that one day I would want to give that up. And it came to the point where it was undeniable that I needed to go full time. And it, came, it was my decision. The Lord put it on my, my heart that Lisa and I talked. And I said, I had to give up my job at American. Can I tell you, that was a difficult decision. But that was a defining moment. That was a defining moment when I needed to finally just trust God, go all in and let go. And even though I had to put this thing on the altar, like Abraham putting Isaac on the altar, not as dramatic, but same. Whoa, that's a terrible photo. I didn't even know that's the one we were using. Hello. Anyway, moving right along. Take that off. The, you know what would be worse? This would be worse. That would be worse. I asked for a photo of Abraham and Isaac on the altar and something. They, thank you, Deja. You guys did a good job. Kind of. <laughs> Terrible photo. My flight benefits according to Isaac and Abraham. Not, not the same. But you get it, right? Sometimes you're going to have to put something on the altar. Skin in the game. And when I put that on the altar, my flight benefits in American Airlines at a $20 an hour job, part-time, when I put that on the altar, I thought, I'd never see my parents again as much as I want to. They're probably going to have to fly down and come see us. I'll probably get there once every two years, fly up my family. I'm thinking this all through, oh, God, I'm just going to put this on. And I wasn't taking up my violin. It was a re reality. And about two years later, and to, the, to this day, God has stamped my passport like I never expected. <laughs> Come on, when you put something on the altar, God brings it back better than ever before. Can I get an amen? amen? Decisions. Decisions. Defining moments. Moses is about to have a defining moment that you, are, you and I are going to read about. But before Moses makes some of the toughest decisions of his life, Moses made some poor decisions. Some bad decisions. There are, so listen, especially if you're under 25, because 26, I'm expecting wisdom is kicking in. But if, especially if you're under 25. Decisions are very, very important. Sometimes we think it's a good decision or a bad decision. Good, bad, T, put a T, plus the positives, the negatives. The positives, the negatives, the negatives, the negatives. And then we start to make our decision on a good or bad decision. That's a good decision, that's a bad decision, right? It's normally how we make our decisions. We weigh it. Like, let me tell you, there's a hierarchy to decision making. And this is where wisdom comes in. Say it with me. Poor, good, better, best. Say it. Poor, good, better, best. One more time. Poor, good, better, best. One more time. Poor, good, better, best. That's a poor decision. What were you thinking? That's a poor decision, obviously. Then there are good decisions. That's a good decision. It's a good, that's a good decision, son. Good call. Proud of you. Good job. But there's oftentimes going to be a better one. And then ultimately, there is always a best decision. Poor, good, better, or best. You always want to aim for the best decision that you can make. Poor, don't make those. Good, not bad, but there's always a better and a best. Moses made some bad decisions. Mo Moses made some great decisions. We're going to talk about a great decision that he made. Moses, as a matter of fact, before the children of Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years, before God gave them the Ten Commandments through Moses, and before the parting of the Red Sea, in which Israel would walk through on dry ground, miraculous, before the ten plagues that God would send upon the people of Egypt because of enslaving his people, Moses would have an encounter with God that would leave him with a defining moment. The defining moment would be based upon the decision that he would have to make in Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 1 that Moses was a little baby boy because Pharaoh of Egypt decided to practice genocide at that time. The people of Israel had multiplied like crazy in the land of Goshen. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, their offspring, were about 72 people in total. But they came out of Canaan because of the famine. Joseph just happened to be there because he was sold into slavery by his brothers. But he rose up the ranks through faithfulness from Potiphar's house, from the pit, from the prison. Now all of a sudden he is in the palace. 
This is only God. God is orchestrating pieces on the chess table in order to bring the people of Israel from Canaan, where there was a famine, over to Egypt so that they would occupy Egypt. And for 400 years, they did. But then there arose a Pharaoh, the Bible says in the New King James Version, that who knew not Joseph. He didn't know who Joseph was online, had no idea, and as a matter of fact, didn't even care who Joseph was. Joseph saved them because God spoke to Joseph in the prison. And while he's in the prison, he gets a vision or a dream of seven fat, well, he's able to interpret the dream of Pharaoh of seven fat cows and seven skinny cows coming out of the Nile and those seven skinny cows devouring the seven fat cows. And Pharaoh could not sleep. The only person they could find to interpret the dream was Joseph. Joseph tells him, we need to prepare. There are seven years of famine coming during the next seven years of plenty. So we need to store it up. And that's what they did. And sure enough, he becomes the second in command of all of Egypt. Imagine a Hebrew being the second command of all of Egypt. God elevates him. And there he is. And 400 years later, they have babies like crazy. And now they've gone from a family of 72 for what scholars believe almost 3 million people strong. All related. Crazy. <laughs> but in Exodus chapter 3, we find Moses on the backside of a desert. Moses, who had been in the palace. Moses' name means I drew him out of water. Moses was the baby during genocide that his mother decided to keep him alive. I'm going to keep him alive. I'm keeping this one. I'm not giving in to the pressure of all the other wives. How come you still get your baby? Never mind you. Keeping on to his baby. She's keeping on to her baby. Just throwing a little humor out there. Keeping her baby. And finally, she cannot contain it. She begins to make this basket, weaves a basket together out of papyrus. If here we, we would use lauhala. Put it all together. Put a pillow, punains on the inside. On the outside, pitch it. Make sure that it's got bitumos. Send it down the river, down the Nile, and watch her little baby boy in a little mini ark of safety going down the river, praying that he ends up in the right hands and not in the mouth of a crocodile while her little sister Miriam begins to watch from behind uh, from a distance and all of a sudden Pharaoh's daughter is beautiful and she goes to the river in order to get her mani pedi spa day and while she's out there by the river bathing one of the maidens of Pharaoh's daughter sees a little basket opens the basket and goes oi a little baby Hebrew boy and says Pharaoh's daughter says bring him to me and she named him Moses for I drew him out of water and saw this little baby girl named Miriam, a toddler. So, hi, Miriam. Oh, no, you don't know her name. But Miriam, anyway, I'm getting the story mixed up. I'm animating too much. Mike, stick with the context in the scripture. And then all of a sudden, she says, we need to nurse him. And, oh, I can have a woman nurse him. And says, so, great. And so Pharaoh's daughter gives it to, the daughter, to Miriam to take to her mother, which is Moses' mother, to breastfeed him. And this happens for several years. The boy's going his mother, that mother, going all over this place. This is going to sound like our family sometimes. You know what I mean? It's complicated. God uses the complicated. And then Moses kills the Egyptian. We fast forward. He's got to run away. He's older now. He's 40 years old. And now he's 80 years old. And come on, 80 is the new 30, somebody. 80. 80, not your 80 or our 80, which is old. I'm, I'm going to be 80 one day. But I'm talking about 80 back in biblical times. Look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. It says, one day Moses was tending the flock, sheep, of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Look at that. That's a sentence that's packed with theological ramifications. Look at that. The angel of the Lord. Every time we see the angel of the Lord, what, who is he? He is a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus. Whenever you see the book of Judges, angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. It's always a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus. So the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. And Moses stared in amazement, just mesmerized. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. 
This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't this bush burning up? I must go see it. And when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Wait, the bush talks? And the bush says, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses, Moses, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned him. Take off your sandals. Hemo your slipper, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. He will cover his face again when he comes down with the Ten Commandments. Years later, people are not going to be able to handle the glory that is on him. Verse 6, God says, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses covers his face. And in verse 7, then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen, watch this, the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them, see, rescue and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. Listen to this, everybody. He says, I have seen, I have heard, I am aware, so I have come down. Somebody needs to hear this today, that God can see what you're going through. God can hear what predicament you are in through your prayers and your conversations. God can see, God can hear. God is aware of what's happening in your life, and he cares, and so he has come down. He is already here. Come on, somebody. Can we get an amen? Come on. Can we thank the Lord? He sees, he hears, he is aware. He sees, he hears, he is aware. There is no place that you can go that God isn't aware of what is going on in your life. You can't hide out in your bedroom. You can't close that door. You can't put yourself in, a, in your feelings. I want you to know that God sees, he hears, he's aware because he loves you in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Then he says, it is a land flowing with milk and honey. Flowing with milk and honey. I hear that throughout the book of Genesis. Oh, actually, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Milk and honey, milk and honey. Milk and honey sounds awesome, right? Milk and honey. How about add some anahola granola to that? How about some little acai to that? How about some bee pollen, somebody? Some blueberries? You know what? Go sell that on the North Shore for 18 bucks. Let's go. <laughs> I always wonder, what is, what is milk and honey? You know what I, I found out later on? Milk and honey means milk. Milk. Where do you get milk from? A cow. Where do you get milk from? You, 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 you milk a goat, right? You milk a cow. You milk a turkey. Anybody milk a turkey? I never milked a turkey. I just thrown that out there. Just try, any farmers in the house? I don't think so. Milk, you milk livestock. Livestock. It's it, oh, honey. Where do you get honey from? Bees. Where do you get bees from? Birds. The birds and the bees, right? No, just kidding. Bees. You, bees get honey. What are the bees, what are, they, what are they doing? They're pollinating. They're pollinating what? They're pollinating blossoms in order to what? To spread it in order to have fruit. So wait, wait, you're telling me that the land flowing with milk and honey is really a land of agricultural, immense agriculture, of livestock, of fruits and trees. This is the land, and we're talking about a lot of land, because you know how much land it takes for one cow in order to produce milk? A lot. A lot. You can't put 20 cows in an acre and think you're going to have milk. Not going to happen. Not enough grass. Land. Land flowing with milk and honey. Look, uh, he goes on to say, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. You guys paying attention. Watch this. Look, land of milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Parasites, the Electrolytes, and the Mosquito Bites. <laughs> the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, God said. And I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Three things, four things, five. Let's make it five. I'm feeling good today. We'll go five. Four questions, one statement. Here it is. Write it down, write it down, write it down. Decision making, decision making, decision making. When you come to a defining moment, number one, you're going to do like Moses. Moses says in verse 11, who am I to appear before him? Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to go throw my hat in the ring? Who am I to apply for that promotion? Who am I to think that I can go from union to management? Who am I to think that I, come on somebody, who am I to think that I can own my own business and be successful one day? Who am I to come from a small town? Who am I? 
Who am I? Exactly. Great question. Number one, it's a question of insecurity. It's a question of insecurity. If you're asking that question, that's a very good question. God says, what does he say? He says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Don't you worry. I will be with you. If God is with you, if God is for you, who can be against you? Verse 13, he says, well, who's representing him? Who, under whose authority am I going? The question of authority. Number two, the question of authority. In other words, who's sending me? Under whose authority am I being sent or I'm going on my own? I'm going without covering. I'm going without covering. Or am I going with covering? You're going with covering. You're going with covering. Question of authority. He said, tell him I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's all you need to say. Number three is the question of credibility. Credibility. He says, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they don't believe me? Oh, God says, look, don't worry about your credibility. I am your credibility. I am your credibility. With this staff, you will perform miraculous signs and wonders. With this staff, put it on the ground. It turns into a snake. Pick it up. turns back into a staff. That's your credibility. I got your credibility right here. Another question, Exodus says, I can't speak, and sometimes I stutter when I get nervous. As a matter of fact, I've been with sheep all week, all day. I come home, I talk to my wife, we hardly talk, because the first thing I say, hey, babe, how are you? <laughs> the question of ability. Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? The question of ability. The question of insecurity. Good question. It's okay to be insecure, but you overcome that. The question of authority, whose covering are you going under? The question of credibility, do you have what it takes? Uh, the question of ability, ex excuse me, and credibility. And here, Moses says in verse 3, watch this, but Moses said and pleaded, Lord, please send someone else. Mm -mm. God could. God said, I'll use somebody else. I'll use, your, I'll use your brother. But he didn't. God said, I'm using you. I'm using you. I'm using you. I waited for you for 40 years in the desert for you to mature. I waited. It took 40 years, 40 years for me to finally come and see you and burn this bush. 40 years for you to get over your pride. 40 years for you to help conquer your anger. 40 years for you to think about you took a man's life. 40 years. Now I think you're ready. So here I am. Here's a one statement. The statement Moses said in verse 13, Lord, please send somebody else, is a statement of inadequacy. I'm inadequate. Not enough to do the job. You're right. We're all inadequate at some point when we begin. We're all inadequate. We don't have enough. In other words, I'm not qualified. I'm not certified. I'm not verified. But we, you and I should get there. I'm not qualified. I'm not certified. I'm not verified. Or I'm not licensed. But you should still attain that. I have no degree. I have no experience. Minimal experience. I don't have the right pedigree. Exactly. God says, perfect. You're, you're the right man for the job. You're the right person for the job. You're the right person. Verse 14, then the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said. What about your brother, Aaron, the Levite? I know he speaks well. And look, he's on his way to meet you now. He'll be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with both of you as you speak. And I will construct, instruct you in both in what, you, what to do. And Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece. And you will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say. And take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs that I have shown you. In verse 18, so Moses went back home to Jericho, his father-in-law. Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt, Moses said. I don't even know if they are alive. Look at the, look, the gap between verse 17 and 18. There's a gap without having a gap. And it is in this place that Moses literally has to wrestle with God and follow him and obey. Moses' father-in-law Jethro replied, he said, go in peace. Go in peace. Insecurity, authority, credibility, ability, and inadequacy. All of those are meant to be overcome. All of that is meant for you to conquer. What leads us into divining moments? Number one, write this down. Number one, step into responsibility. Step into responsibility. When you take responsibility and you own it, you own what you've been given, even though it belongs to another. Most of us are not self-employed. Some people are self-employed in this room. Most people in this room have to report to somebody else. It could be an officer, it could be a boss, an employer, whatever it is, we are all reporting to somebody else, most people. 
Most people do. And then sometimes you are mostly working for someone else's aspirations or someone else's goals, and you find your own way to put your own aspirations in, and goals within the context of working for someone else. Nothing wrong with working for somebody else. As a matter of fact, you can only trust sometimes people who have worked for somebody else who now work on their own is because they've already worked for somebody else. They were already someone under authority. They understand working with someone under authority. They are under that authority. That's the covering. And when they understand that then when they go on their own they make it great here's why because they understood what it meant to have responsibility to have responsibility brings humility to have responsibility brings servanthood it's a servant's heart it's a humility that is brought when God was looking for a leader God wasn't looking for a lone ranger God what was he looking for he was looking for a shepherd when two of the most significant times that God needed a leader of his people was Moses and David Moses would have to lead three million people out of a desert. David would have to take a nation and make it great. And David would have to pass on at the zenith of his reign, hand it off to his son, Solomon. Shepherds were critical. Shepherds were people that would lead the flock. Shepherds were people that would lead from the front, not from the back. That's what God needed. God needed someone who understood responsibility and was a shepherd. Second thing that happened is number two. You're writing this down in your notes. Is number two is you got to stay the course. Stay the course. You have to be patient. You have to be patient. Stay the course. Stay the course, and God's going to bring a defining moment. I said defining moments are about decision-making, not providential moves, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that God's providence happens, that God works it all out for his good and according to your purpose. God can, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, after you having gone through one marriage and failed in that one, and then now God's healed your heart, and now brought you a husband or brought you a wife, and now you are Romans 8, 28-ing that out. God's working all things for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. God can, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, your career, that you thought that you were going to do this with your life, now you're doing this with your life. That's a Romans 8, verse 28. I've seen God take a Romans 8, verse 28 situation in someone's life for someone that was a drug addict, for someone that was an alcoholic. God can turn around your life if you let him. But then there are decisions that you make that define you. And it is in those decisions that you are making that you are trusting in the Lord with all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. What school do I go to? What job do I take? Who do I date? Who will I marry? Those decisions are very, very important. They're not laissez-faire, come see, come saw decisions. They are decisions that take fasting. They take prayer. They take leaning into God. And that's why we get confused when we don't know because we're not staying the course and trusting God. We're, we're going by emotion. We're going by need. And God says, I want you to be led by my spirit. That's why it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The spirit of God and the word of God lead you. Stay the course. But I also understand that not everybody is going to, so there's going to be some time where you're going to be discontent. I feel like I feel like I got to do another job. Have you noticed? Where are all the workers lately? I know I'm talking to a bunch of workers, but, you know, we work hard in this church. For people of Inspired Church, you are salt and light. You permeate wherever you go, baby. Let's go. But I can tell you this. I go to this business, we don't have enough workers. We're going to have to close. We're only open Tuesday till Friday. Wow. But they're doing pretty good. Inflation has gone up. Supply chain is bad. We can't get enough cups. We can't get enough napkins. Got to let you go. What? It's crazy, right? And so now all of a sudden, I, I've seen this happening. It's kind of like America or even Hawaii has turned into like a, we're free agents. I'm a free agent. I'll go to the highest bidder. I'm going to pay the most. I'll go, I'll go here. Rather than being led by the Spirit of God, we, we're being led by mammon. Don't let, don't, don't let money lead you. Don't let money lead you. Don't let the money lead you. Money's important. But you have to master your money. Otherwise, mammon's got you. Yeah? Did I ever tell you who mammon is? The spirit behind money. See, money is not evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil, not money. Money's good in the right hands. In the right hands, money is good. Okay, I don't know why I went there, but maybe this crowd needed to hear it, or maybe just one person. I don't know. Anyway, moving right along. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. We're not free agents. Not work here one year, work that two years, work here one year, okay? But then there are going to be times that you have to do that because of what you do. Okay. Can I say something? Some people are going to do what they do for 40 years, 45 years. And that's amazing if you can do that. 
Steve Adar, 40 years, bro. Right on. Hawaiian Airlines flight attendant, 35 years. Awesome. Me too. Pastor one church, 30 years, 20 years, 22 years. This year, 22 years. Longevity. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. You ain't going to offer me more money. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leading, being led by the money. Being led by the Spirit of God. Don't even... Think about this. But there are going to be times that you're going to be filled with a holy discontent. And you feel like God is stirring something that maybe God is getting, he's, he's putting thorns in the nest and getting you ready to one day launch. And they are defining moments. My dad, who was my hero, you guys all know that. He was a police officer. My dad was a great police officer. As a matter of fact, he was so good, he was policeman of the year twice in a 12-year career. That's pretty awesome. He got promoted to sergeant by his eighth year, paid his dues, seniority, passed all the tests. But then in the next four years, realized that he wasn't going to make lieutenant, wasn't going to make captain, definitely wasn't going to make chief. And so he saw the ceiling. My dad was an achiever. The writing was on the wall. And God had put some holy discontentment in him, but he was still great. He didn't, he didn't ruffle feathers. He didn't, he didn't create chaos. What he did was he stayed the course. And then God saw it and brought the De Dominical family who owned Golden Grain Macaroni and Ghirardelli Chocolate, and they took over Hawaiian Holiday Macadamia Nut. And if you knew my town of Honoka, it just wasn't sugar cane. It was also macadamia nuts. And this family made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. And my dad left the job security of a good job. That's why I love police officers that after 12 years said, you know what, I think I'm going to move into the private sector. And he did. And you know what, that decision that my dad made in a small town where we grew up on, that was a game-changing decision that my dad made for his family. And we think differently. We saw things differently. It made us a little bit different. Didn't make us better. It made us different. And we saw things differently. And I thank the Lord for my dad stepping out of his comfort zone to do something that he otherwise wouldn't have done. And I praise God. God would have still taken care of us uh, if he was still with the police department on the big island. But man, he stepped into a zone of uncomfortability. And out of that, he became a personnel director, not just the chief of security. Then he became the sales manager. Then he became that entrepreneur he always wanted to be. And then my dad started four different businesses. And I look at him, and I go, thanks, Dad. You changed the trajectory of our family. I'm telling you, <laughs> obedience, worship team can come up. Obedience can change the destiny of your family, and if not hundreds, possibly thousands of people's of lives. Because you say yes to God. Don't stop saying yes to God. Be led by the Spirit of God. Be obedient to Him. I didn't, I didn't say I'm going to live my life to this point with obedience. And after that, no obedience. I'll do what I want to do. No. That will never work for me. And that won't work for God. It's not going to work for God. God wants you to trust in Him. Every step of the journey. Because he's got big plans for you. You might not think it, but I'm telling you right now, he does. Got huge plans. Can I get every high school, junior high student to stand up right now? I want to pray for you. High school, junior high, college, stand up right now. I want to pray for you. Don't be shy. You're not too good for this. I'm not going to embarrass you. You are entering into a very critical year of your life. 2023 can be the year of favor, 24 can be the year of favor over your life if you live obediently for God. And I want you to know that God wants you to win. He wants you to succeed in what you're doing. He wants you to be blessed. But you have to be sold out for Him. You cannot straddle the fence. You can't play it lukewarm. You have to trust Him. And the decisions that you make in your junior, senior year especially, every year, but your junior and senior year will determine your freshman, sophomore, even, even if you go to school and even if you choose not to. You are about to make the best decisions you have ever made in your life. You understand critical thinking. You understand good, poor, good, better, best. You understand there is a, a proactive thinking. There is um, reactive thinking and decision making. And I'm praying that God begins to bless you with wisdom, that you would be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we'll throw Esther in there. And that you'd be 10 times better than everybody else in what you do in Jesus name you're standing I'm gonna pray for them but I want to ask this service not to leave until this service is done done okay
okay? Because I know, I know you got to go lunch, but it's just, it's just, it's just distracting. Maybe you stand up, bah, 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 hear all the chairs, people are leaving, and say, Pastor Mike, they leave early at the 10.30. No, they're not leaving now. Anyway, moving right along. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, don't leave early. Leave when, well, we, we're going to finish, we're going to land, we're going to land the plane on time. I, I grew up in an era with hours, services was two hours, everybody. Now we get hour, 10 minutes, everybody get antsy. All right, we're going to stretch out our hands and pray for these young people. I want you to stretch out your hands and pray for these young people. Let's come up. We're going to stretch them out. Stretch them out. There's some behind you right now. There's some in front of you. Father God, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. And God, I thank you for these sons and daughters of yours, Lord God. And Father, I pray your protection and favor and blessing would be upon them, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would give them wisdom beyond their years. Father, I pray that you'd give them creative solutions wherever they are. And Father, I pray that you make them wise as serpents and innocent as doves. As they enter into a woke society, Lord God, I pray that you make them strong in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that they would not uh, lose their convictions. Father, I pray they would understand their biblical values. Father, I pray they would not give in to relativism. But Father, they would understand that it's by the Word of God that things, the Word of God never changes. And so that society shouldn't change. But even though the society changes, that they would remain true to you. So Father, I pray that you bless their friendships, their relationships. Father, I pray that you keep the wrong people out of their lives. Keep the right people in it, Lord God. And Father, I pray right now that you'd protect them. It's a... That that world out there of that trafficking is crazy right now. So, Lord, I pray that you would keep them safe in the name of Jesus. Make 2023 and 2024 their best year yet in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we thank the Lord, everybody? We're not done yet. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. This is the most, you can sit, but this is the most important part. This is where we're going to talk about salvation. And we're going to talk about salvation. And I need two minutes on salvation, and then we're going to release you. Because people's eternities are hanging in the balance. By the way, by the book, Jensen Franklin, very, very important, good friend of mine. He's coming in 2024. Think about this for a moment. If, keep your eyes open and your heads up. If you've never given your life to Jesus, what would be a better time than today? What would you wait for? There's not, you can't go home and go clean my life up. I'm going to say goodbye to her, say goodbye to him, and I'll go fix it, and then I'll come back up. No, I'm going to put that in the ashtray out. I'll throw it away. I'll empty out the closet. I promise I won't do it again. Then I'll come back. No, you're not coming back because the devil knows how to play. He knows how to play. He knows what to do. He knows what your trigger is. And I'm telling you right now, God took what God took to get you here today. He was ready. He was waiting. He was patient. He made a circumstance happen for you to come to church today. You fought traffic, child care. You, you got plans. And I'm telling you right now, he has your attention. You have his attention right now. And no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, no matter what kind of religion you had before this or philosophy you might have had, or if you accepted Jesus when you were younger and you walked away from it and here you're back, God's got you back. He's got you back because he loves you so much. And you are in this room here today by divine appointment. You're not here by design. You're not here by your own, your, your, your own moves and your Uber that you got here. You are here because God knew that you would be in this room here today listening to this message. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You know why? God wants you to have everlasting life. That's why he sent his son Jesus. According to John chapter 3 verse 3 says, you must be born again. And if you don't even know what that is, or you have no idea, then you're not. And you should be. Today is the day of your salvation. The days are evil. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. You can come back at any time. You don't want to be left behind. And if you no matter, and if this is you to, that, that's you today, that you want Jesus. I'm telling you right now, there's only heaven and hell. The Bible says that there's a heaven and there's a hell. There's no purgatory to be found in this. There's no reincarnation to be found in this. You're not coming back as a tree. You're not coming back as a dolphin. You're not coming back as a TSA agent. Sorry. Sorry. So I just wanted to throw, if you travel, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I love TSA agents. We have a lot of them in this church. Uh, you are not coming back as anything else. As a matter of fact, we die and then comes eternity. And that's why Jesus pleaded, that's why the blood, that's what the blood is for. The blood was not just for the angel of death to pass over. The blood was to forgive me and you of our sins. That's why you took a lamb. You took a lamb in Exodus. It was a, a perfect lamb. It wasn't a lamb that was hurting. It wasn't a lamb that was missing an ear. It wasn't that kind of, it had to be a perfect lamb. 
Jesus Christ is the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When you die, your last breath will be on earth, will be your first breath in heaven, if that's what you want. You want eternity, you want Jesus in your life, you want hope. At the count of three, from the front to the back, to the left, to the right, first row, second row, fifth row, this side, that side, I find the floor rarely lifts their hands. And I'll give you a preemptive why. Because you think everybody's watching you, nobody's watching you. It's just you and Jesus. This message is tailor-made for you. It's only him speaking to you. It's not me. And if that's you, then if you want Jesus in your life, and you've never done this before, or you feel like you need to rededicate your life to God because the, your heart is not right, your thinking is all wrong, if that's you, then at the count of three, raise your hand. Here we go. One, he will never let you down. He's never going to let you down. He will walk with you. He will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Number one, he will never let you down. Two, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Get ready to raise it. Here we go. One, get ready. Two, one, two, three. Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Put your hand up if that's you. Put your hand up if that's you. Come on, put them up high. Keep them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. 21, 21, 22, 23, 24, yes, 25 right there, I got you, 26, 27, 27, 27, 28, 29, 30 right there, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 38, 39 at the top, 40 right there, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 56, 56, where is 57 right there, 58, 59, 60 right there, 60, at, at least, at least 60. Come on, can we praise God? Okay. I want, the, I want everybody to stand right now, right where you are. And I want everybody in, online and in person to repeat this prayer after me. Stand if you're able to stand. If you're not able to stand, it's okay. I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me, especially the 60 people that raised their hands in person. I don't know how many online. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, today I surrender and give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross, shedding your blood that washes my sins as white as snow. I also thank you that when I die, I'll be in your presence for all eternity. But while I'm here, Make my life count. Use me. Mold me. Shape me. Lead me. Heal me. Fill me. Guide me. And send me. I'm born again. The old is past. The new is begun. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Created to serve you and to bring you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Can we thank the Lord, everybody?